I'm Caleb Morse. I'm the collection manager at the McGregor Herbarium, which is the Botany Research Division of the Biodiversity Institute of the University of Kansas. And I'm here today to tell you about some extraordinary extremophilic organisms that live pretty much everywhere in the world, including in your own backyard. What are these organisms? Well, they're lichens. Let's go find some. So here I am in my backyard, and I found some lichens wasn't too hard. Lichens are pretty much everywhere. You can find them on your sidewalks and like these ones on my on your branches. Here's a big orange lichen and a big gray lichen and a smaller dark gray lichen and a yellow lichen. All of these different species of lichens were growing on this branch that I cut down last fall. And if you look on any tree in town, you'll find lichens like these. And in fact, if you look on your sidewalks, you might find lichens, or sometimes even on your roofs. Lichens are everywhere. But what are lichens? Well, lichens are fungi that feed themselves in the same way that plants do. And how do plants feed themselves? Well, plants feed themselves by uh, something we call photosynthesis, which is a difficult word to say, but a really cool process by which plants take carbon dioxide, which is a gas in the air, and water, and in the presence of sunlight, they make carbohydrates and oxygen. Now, plants take those carbohydrates and they build their bodies with them, so they make wood and bark and leaves and flowers and fruits. But lichens are fungi that feed themselves like plants, so they're not quite plants. They're fungi. What are fungi? Well, most of the time we think of uh, fungi as being something like mushrooms that would spring up in a lawn after a drenching summer rain. And those fungi are feeding themselves by breaking down dead uh, plant matter or maybe dead animal matter in the soil. And we call those fungi decomposers. But lichens are fungi that don't feed themselves in that way. They feed themselves by photosynthesizing. So how in the world does a fungus photosynthesize? Well, lichens photosynthesize by entering into a symbiotic relationship with one or more photosynthetic organisms, which informally we call them algae, although they may be algae or they may be photosynthetic bacteria. But algae are things that we think of as being like seaweeds or pond scum, and they can be brown or red or green. Uh, and indeed, those, those uh, photosynthetic organisms are plants. They're tiny plants, and they photosynthesize just like plants. And so when they live in a, in a lichen, they're photosynthesizing and making carbohydrates just like any plant would. And the lichen is using those products of photosynthesis. So this is a, a symbiotic relationship. And a symbiotic relationship is a relationship in which both partners benefit from being in the relationship. In this case, the fungus obviously benefits from getting all those carbohydrates that the alga makes. And in exchange, the alga gets a safe place to live protection from herbivores like snails and uh, and also has the opportunity to colonize uh, new places that algae often don't grow like chunks of trees. Okay so lichens are photosynthetic fungi which is really cool but it's not what makes them extremophiles. An extremophile is an organism that can survive and maybe even thrive in conditions that would kill normal plants and animals. And lichens are extremophiles in a couple of different ways. Let's talk about one, which is in, in how they deal with water. So remember that photosynthesis is a process that requires water, pretty much a constant supply of water. Now, lichens are photosynthetic organisms, but they're also something called a poikilohydric organism. And it's a ridiculous word, but it basically means that lichens, like some other organisms in the world, uh, are basically as wet as their surroundings. They have no way of limiting water loss or, in fact, actively seeking out water. So all of the water that enters a lichen is kind of passively absorbed right through its skin. Lichens have no way of limiting water loss. So just as easily as they suck up water through their skin, they lose it. Many lichens absorb most of their water through dewfall and are maximally hydrated first thing in the morning. Sometimes if it's a rainy day, they'll be wet through the afternoon but usually they're they're wet first thing in the morning and as soon as the sun comes out boom they start photosynthesizing but as soon as they start photosynthesizing guess what they also start losing their water so it's kind of a race they photosynthesize as much as they can until they dry and often by about noon lichens are 
too dry to do any more photosynthesis. So what do they do? Well, they shut down. They just kind of go dormant for the afternoon. If a plant lost all its water, it would start to die. But lichens just kind of go to sleep. And they wait for the next opportunity to be wet. And that's one of the ways in which that they're, they tolerate really extreme environmental conditions, even on a tree in your backyard. So when dry, most lichens are only about 10% water. But they have the ability to absorb as much as 200% of their weight in water in a pretty short time. So what does this mean? Well, here's a little analogy. That's a balloon. It weighs about a third of a gram. But if it were a lichen, it would be able to absorb about this much water, which is about 55 grams of water, every night to use when it's photosynthesizing the next day. Now, the amazing thing about lichens, back to our lichen, is that they have rigid cell walls. So unlike the balloon, they won't swell up with water. They'll look a little different, they'll be greener, but they won't get big and round. So humans, by comparison, are always about 60% water, and if we lose much water, we'll die of thirst. But imagine if a 50-pound kid could live like a lichen. She'd go from weighing about 4,000 pounds in the morning to about 23 pounds by the afternoon every single day. That's like weighing as much as a small elephant in the morning, but a medium-sized koala bear in the afternoon, and all without any noticeable change in size. So many lichen species, like the ones in your backyard, are adapted to undergo small daily droughts. Now it turns out that an organism that's adapted to undergoing these small daily droughts is probably also able to undergo much more severe and persistent droughts. A lichen that can endure this kind of severe and persistent drought is perfectly adapted to growing in the world's most arid and inhospitable places, like the Atacama Desert or the Namib Desert, where they might get seven inches of rain a year. And indeed, in, in those places, lichens are often the most diverse and abundant photosynthetic organisms. Now, related to this, some lichen species are able to grow in really cold climates. Indeed, some, some lichens like this little map lichen and its, and its relatives that grow in Antarctica have been shown to be able to photosynthesize and make carbohydrates at temperatures well below freezing. These kinds of lichens can actually photosynthesize at temperatures down to four degrees below zero Fahrenheit. If you look around the world's cold places, often those places are dominated by lichens. If you were an organism that could photosynthesize maybe a few hours a day, or maybe not at all one day, and some the next, you'd probably grow pretty slowly. And indeed, lichens grow pretty slowly. Most lichens are thought to grow maybe two or three millimeters a year. The ones that grow in really cold places may be growing half a millimeter a year. If you're growing really slowly like this, you may as well live a long time. And many lichens live a long time. Some species are thought to live for decades, and some species are thought to live for centuries. Relatives of this unassuming map lichen, again, that grow in Antarctica, are thought to live maybe 5,000 years. Now that you've learned a little bit about lichens and what makes lichens so interesting, you have an opportunity to make and name your own felt lichen. And if you want it to look like a lichen, you just need to keep a couple of things in mind. And here they are. So when we talk about lichens, there are usually three kinds of lichens that we talk about. There are foliose lichens, and crustose lichens, and fruticose lichens. Now a foliose lichen, like this one, has a distinct upper and lower surface. And in this case, the upper surface is kind of greenish or grayish, and the lower surface is brownish. You can see it over here. And also, the lower surface has tiny little root-like structures on it, little black hairs, that actually just hold the lichen down to its substrate, which in this case is a piece of bark. Crustose lichens, like this lichen here, only have an upper surface, and they're tightly adhered to the rock or the bark that they grow on. And if you try to scrape them off, you're not going to find a lower surface. You'll find some, maybe some cottony material, which is actually part of the fungus. It looks a little like cotton candy. But they only have an upper surface and no lower surface, and they're usually kind of crusty. The third kind of lichen is what we call a fruticose lichen. Here's a fruticose lichen right here. This is an orange fruticose lichen, one of the few kinds we have in eastern Kansas. And fruticose lichens don't have a different upper and lower surface. They're sort of three-dimensional. They look like little tiny trees or shrubs. Now, these 
three kinds of lichens look really different. They all have a couple of things in common. Here's my pretend lichen that I made a few years ago. It's just a couple of pieces of board, and it's a folios lichen. You can see it's got an upper surface and a lower surface. And on the front, on the top of it, I put a few of these round disc-like structures. And if this were a real lichen, this is where it would make its spores. Now, this is a folios lichen, so it's got the top and lower surface. But just like all the other kinds of lichens, inside, if you open it up, it's got a layer of what? Algae. Algae are how a lichen photosynthesizes, so all lichens have a layer of algae, just like this. And so if you're going to make a folios lichen, your lichen's going to look a little like a sandwich with an upper surface and a lower surface and a green piece of felt representing your alga inside. When we go out and collect lichens for our research collection, we put them in packets like these. And these packets tell you what the lichen is and where it came from and when it was collected. And then inside, when you open the packet, it's got a nice specimen. This is the same fruticos lichen we just looked at. It's called golden eye lichen. Very common lichen. Here's a weird lichen that's got all these funny little spires on it. That's how it reproduces. It's called a cladonia lichen, sometimes called a reindeer lichen. And here's an interesting lichen that came from South Dakota. This is actually two different kinds of lichens. The yellow one is a parasite of the orange one and uses its nutrients for a while anyway. And that lichen grew on a rock and it was a crust and I couldn't get it off the rock so I just took the rock with it. Here are some lichens that my research associates made to represent for their felt lichens. Here is an octopus lichen by Helen. It's a four-footed octopus lichen and inside you can see it's got its algal layer. Here is a cookie lichen by Lydia and its fruiting bodies look like little black dots all over the surface but inside it's got its algal layer and it's growing on a rock. And here is a leaf lichen that Katie made and it's got brown dots all over to represent the places where it's making its spores and it's a folios lichen so it's got rhizines on the lower surface but inside you can see it's still got its algal layer. So go off and make your lichens and have a good time. Thanks.